Mark, the dollar finally breaks down. Is it enough of a break for you to switch to a bit of a weak dollar? Well, yeah, I, I think we still like the medium term dollar down story. I think there's an interesting element where the global economy is doing pretty good. It's catching up with the United States. We do see absolute growth levels that are favoring the U.S., but the delta of growth, which matters for currencies, is moving in a weaker dollar direction. The most important factor is really, again, the Fed is allowing the weakness in the dollar essentially because what they're trying to do is run the economy hot, let inflation run higher, and they're experimenting with uh, what feels like an MMT-type narrative. So you add those things together, and the dollar's still overvalued, and we're still seeing, again, the global story is, is moving the right direction. So those are ingredients for a medium-term dollar move lower. But I think the more interesting action is really on the kind of the month-to-month, -month, the three-month, the quarterly basis, which is really giving us really interesting pivot points to make tactical decisions whether or not you want to overweight or underweight currencies against the dollar in that uh, timeline. So, Mark, we're trying to resolve a tug of war, the tension, as you've pointed out, between global reflation, a global synchronized recovery, and U.S. exceptionalism. Between that tug of war right now, Mark, what do you think wins out? Yeah, I think right now we kind of have to downgrade global reflation a little bit. It's not really about U.S. exceptionalism, but I think what we had is obviously weak NFP print and really strong inflation numbers. I think what we've learned from a lot of conversations with clients is people are completely mixed. It's one or the other. It's binary. Either the Fed is making a huge mistake and they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to really work to make things better, or they fall on our side, which is basically they're not going to taper anytime soon and they're not going to hike rates until about 2024. Uh, but there's definitely a debate that is very lively that the Fed could taper or start talking about tapering in June, July, or even at Jackson Hole in August. So that's live. And I think in that environment, what we're seeing is reflation is starting to move a little bit lower based on the mobility that we track on a daily basis. Volatility should be higher. Inflation break even should be a little bit lower and real rates should be a little bit higher. So in that backdrop, that's a little bit more positive for the dollar. Um, at least on a tactical basis versus kind of the medium-term outlook we just okay. outlined. But so, Mark, let's push this through Euro-Dollar right now. High of the year on Euro-Dollar, 123.49, intraday high back on January 6th. Where are you looking to push this through and when? 123, right now 122.23. What are you looking for on Euro-Dollar? I think these are good fade levels. So if you were to take our right here. kind of... Yeah, I think, yeah, if you were to take our year-ahead forecast, we're in a 122 to 118 camp. So even at the end of the year, I think we're going to see a little bit more of a stronger dollar versus the euro. Again, I think most of the action FX is really going to come down to factors that aren't really related or a big driver of the euro, which is really commodity exposure, value, relative economic growth, and even the equity store. I think the upside for the euro that people aren't expecting isn't going to be a central bank trade. It's going to be an equity story. So if European equities start to outperform like they have been, or at least on the daily tracking of ETF flows, that's where I think people could be surprised by the euro. But based on the growth, the carry, the value, and the relative central bank policy, to me, euro is still a sell at 122, and you buy it back around 118, 117. So what could be the trigger for what you're saying, for, for, for the money flooding into European equities and driving euro higher? What data points are you looking at? I think it comes down to the growth in the vaccine catch-up story. That is a big narrative now that I think is, is important. But I think the problem is, is there isn't enough on the other side to say there's a bunch of factors we want to buy the euro on. But if the vaccine story and the growth delta are important. Uh, but we don't see the valuation story there. We don't see the carry argument. We don't see the yield curve steepness. Um, so there, there's a couple elements there. And obviously, commodities is not a big driver of the euro. And that's why you kind of want to look elsewhere in Europe. Again, like the Norwegian Krone, you've got a hawkish central bank. You've got commodity. You've got global connections. So I think with the euro, what you would kind of need to see it is it's already there in the price. Uh, most of our models say the euro is a little bit overdone, and that's why I'm a little wary of chasing it, because you don't have a value story along with a very stellar growth story. You have a pickup story, which is, is interesting, but it's really well known by the market. So, again, I think for the equity story to work out is we really need to see what happens with the German elections later this year. If we do get a pivot to a green-led movement, kind of center-left, I think MMT narrative is much better for Europe because it brings capital back into Europe no more recycling of the current account surplus, and that would be beneficial for the Europe, uh, for the euro. Versus the MMT narrative is not as great for the U.S. because you're taxing 
you know, where the, the marginal driver of innovation comes in the U.S., which is the equity market, which is what the dollar needs this cycle. Okay, just to parse through some of this and dig into a lot of what you're saying, this is going back to the question of is fiscal spending good or bad for a currency? And you're saying that fiscal spending in Europe could be good, whereas fiscal spending in the U.S. could be bad for the dollar with respect to its strength because of the taxation that's likely to accompany it. Am I getting that correctly? Absolutely. I, I think it's very critical. One of the things that is most heavily missed, and I'd say the, even especially the last five years, the relative equity story is absolutely critical. If you think about why the dollar was able to rally during the Trump years, a lot of it had to do is U.S. equities outperformed the rest of the world, and the U.S. yield curve was steepening while the rest of the yield, rest of the world yield curve was flattening. For the dollar to really kind of make up what is, I think, a weak dollar policy from the Fed, it is going to need equity flows. Uh, so in a broad balance of payments context, you're going to have a twin deficit which does need an offset. The twin deficit during the Trump years was offset by equity inflows and the growth story. So I think a big side of it here is if the Euro if European policymakers deliver more positive growth shocks, especially again with the German elections maybe leading to more fiscal stimulus, that's an important development because that gives people a reason to bring capital flows back into Europe where they've been recycling them out of Europe for the past 10 years. So that's where I do think it's critical. And if uh, the U.S. were to tax equity markets and tax the wealth and innovation that comes from the equity markets, that's a, that's a negative for the dollar in the context of where the Fed's going and the global economy is. That's why, again, we like it lower over the medium term.